My recent video on irreducible complexity received a predictable spread of straw man misrepresentations and other fallacious comment. This video builds on the previous one and deconstructs that bogus criticism. An irreducibly complex system is one which, when a part is removed, loses the specific function of that system. In the second minute of my video, I presented a sequence debunking the common claim that the eye is such a system, by showing its vision evolving by degrees. A few dismissed the sequence for not explaining more stages, but for an eye to be irreducibly complex it must have no functional intermediates. So showing even one intermediate refutes that claim, and my video features several. Once we're talking about certain stages being left out, the critic is no longer challenging my argument that the eye is not irreducibly complex. My sequence showed how the eye's visual function can evolve by degrees. To criticise it in effect for not including every aspect of eye evolution one might want to know, as if such information could be condensed in a 10 minute video, is to set up and attack a straw man. But this is a common tactic from some anti-evolutionists, who declare an unbridgeable gap between A and G, and then when you find five intermediates, declare the six new gaps unbridgeable. One person laid bare the impossible levels of detail so often demanded, declaring evolution unreal because we can't produce a video of a real eye evolving in real time. Aside from the absurdity of demanding a video of a process that began millions of years ago, suggesting only things we can put on video should be regarded as real, shows a profound lack of awareness of the array of methods by which science allows us to determine facts. And it dismisses all history before moving photography. Science is an ongoing human endeavour. To dismiss it for being unable to place perfect knowledge or impossible evidence in your lap is not a legitimate position especially when you give no evidence of trying to gain a basic understanding of what we do know through science. The blob of mucus stage in the eye evolution sequence attracted a few incredulous responses. No refutation, just incredulity. Not only did I explain how seeming unbelievable is not a valid guide in science, I cited animals that related to the stages illustrated, including the nautilus, which has mucus secreting glands in its pinhole camera eye. So things that some have declared unbelievable are already documented. One person scoffed, how does this happen, in one generation? Single generation miracles are the opposite of what evolution proposes, which is that complexity evolves over many thousands if not millions of generations. So this is another blatant straw man. One person claimed that the eye's movement within its surrounding structure presents an obstacle to evolution. How could an eye that first evolved as fixed in a socket then become unfixed? But there's no reason that the eye had to evolve as a fixed object and then become unfixed. Movement could easily have been there from the beginning, or as I suggested in my video, it could have evolved alongside the other beneficial changes. This presents no obstacle at all to evolution. Halfway through my video I showed that a standard mousetrap is not irreducibly complex as Michael Behe claims, because we can remove the base and fix the other parts to the surface on which it was resting. I refuted Behe's claim that this just swaps one base for another, pointing out that the standard trap and a trap fixed to one spot have significant differences. But it was claimed this isn't reducing the number of parts, you still need a base. This merely restates Behe's objection, without addressing my answer. The standard trap has an important quality not present in the fixed trap, mobility. In order to move the fixed trap you have to dismantle it and reconstruct it elsewhere. With the standard trap no such procedure is needed, so these traps are not equivalent. An unstated requirement of the standard base is that it rests on another surface. Not just any surface, but a stable surface mice can access. A partial trap fixed directly to that surface absorbs two elements into one, which is a reduction. I was asked, why can't you show us the step-by-step -step pathway to get to the mouse trap? Showing a step-by-step -step pathway to get an object we all agree didn't evolve naturally through a step-by-step -step process would be by definition an exercise in fantasy. It so happens that inventive solutions have been put forward for reducing the standard trap to one part, but whether or not they're valid neither strengthens nor weakens evolutionary theory, which concerns life, not non-living manufactured objects, and therefore has no obligation to show pathways to mouse traps. Towards the end of my video I noted how arguments from complexity would have us believe that flagellum parts had no reason to be there other than to form the flagellum. Notice my phrasing, arguments from complexity would have us believe not be he claims or anyone claims. But one person said this was quote mining be he. Let's all be clear what quote mining is. As I explained in my video, quote mining is deceptively editing or taking a quotation out of context. But this wasn't a be he quote, and I never attributed it to him. 
so it couldn't possibly be a quote mine. When I exposed a Darwin quote mine in my video, I located the quote and restored the context. But my accuser didn't bother to check his facts. He just saw the punctuation, leapt to a conclusion and made a false accusation. Did he graciously admit this when it was pointed out? No. He dumped responsibility for his own error on me, saying I'd made it look like I was quoting Behe, when I'd made no mention of anyone or anything other than arguments from complexity. These punctuation marks are not used only to indicate quotes, they're also used to denote an idea currently being discussed. Earlier on in the video I'd highlighted this idea. It wasn't a quote, it was simply the idea under discussion. Like it or not, this is a commonly expressed argument. But quote mining is a highly specific accusation requiring an actual quote. This accusation was completely bogus. This person also complained irreducible complexity is not a system that can't be constructed one part at a time. It's a functioning system where the removal of any one part causes it to stop functioning. He implied I was using the first definition while Behe was using the second, and that I was therefore again somehow quote mining Behe. He also claimed that the dry stone arch example I gave wasn't irreducibly complex because it didn't have a function. Let's untangle this. Arches like these can function as bridges. Indeed, many bridges are built on exactly these principles. Furthermore, each stone has a function, extending the whole structure with a shape that reinforces its stability. Secondly, nowhere do I define irreducible complexity as a system that can't be constructed one part at a time nor do I quote Behe talking about construction one part at a time. So again, a quote mine without a quote isn't a quote mine. Furthermore, this definition is misleadingly vague. As already mentioned, an irreducibly complex system is one which, when a part is removed, loses the specific function of that system, not one that stops functioning full stop. And incidentally, it's also worth noting that some anti-evolutionists take the definition a step further, falsely asserting that irreducibly complex systems are those that are too complex to have evolved. Clearly, any discussion where one part is using a false definition will run into problems. Explaining how irreducibly complex systems can evolve to someone who thinks they can't evolve by definition is unlikely to be very fruitful. I was criticised for not addressing functional pathways to irreducibly complex systems when I addressed it in several ways. During my discussion of the Venus flytrap, I explained how irreducible complexity can arise indirectly by the subtraction of one element that then makes other elements required. If a leaf traps nutritious insects more efficiently the stickier it gets, and the quicker it closes around its prey, it shouldn't surprise us if it eventually closes so quickly that the stickiness becomes obsolete and is discarded as a needless physical cost. I also stated quite unambiguously how even systems that are irreducibly complex can and do arise gradually through a combination of addition, subtraction, change of parts and or change of the function of parts. During my discussion of the bacterial flagellum, I also pointed out how beneficial secondary functions of component parts provide excellent reasons for them to be there, thus providing a pathway to the later system. And while we're on the subject of the flagellum, at no stage did I argue, as one person suggested, that the flagellum doesn't contain irreducible complexity because its parts have secondary functions. Nowhere did I argue that showing half the parts can still perform a function explains away irreducible complexity. The flagellum discussion was making the important clarification that irreducibly complex systems with parts removed would not necessarily be lacking any function whatsoever. Yet again, those are simple misrepresentations. Far from being the nightmare of the evolutionary biologist, irreducible complexity is something we'd expect to arise now and then from a process that produces staggering anatomical diversity while rewarding efficiency in the streamlining of physical resources. But what clearly seems to be a nightmare for some anti-evolutionists is presenting a valid argument. This video has exposed the catalogue of straw men, arguments from incredulity, red herrings, bogus accusations and plain dishonest misrepresentation that came my way after the original video. From people who've shown themselves to be unwilling to report their opponent's position accurately or get the basics of evolution right. Failing to meet those minimal standards, they also show themselves to be unworthy of serious consideration.